today i wanted to talk to you about uh, religions and peace how they can work together for peace and this is possible only through dialogue as a matter of fact in the year 1993 there was at chicago uh, the second world parliament of religions and they published a declaration on global ethic and it has got four basic affirmations commitment to a culture of non violence and respect for life commitment to a culture of solidarity and a just economic order commitment to a culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness and fourthly commitment to a culture of equal rights and partnership between men and women and they said further no world peace without peace among religions and no peace among religions without a dialogue between religions of course we have to understand this declaration in the context of a conflict or open or subdued that we see between different religious ethnic linguistic cultural groups and so on a little across all over the world it may be more open say today in the middle east uh, but certainly there are tensions in every country in india of course say between hindus muslims and christians in indonesia in malaysia in egypt uh, even the united states i'm sure there is an atmosphere of fear and also in europe we have tension between the christians and muslims and therefore uh, this kind of uh, tension exists everywhere and if you look at why these tensions are there the basic reason is maybe economic uh, certain unequal uh, division of wealth among these different groups it also can be political because uh, some groups are in power and the other groups uh, fle- feel that uh, they don't have the power and therefore in various ways they are oppressed and they want uh, some kind of an autonomy or independence and so on and of course it's also always uh, today a quest for identity one wants to assert one's identity as different from the other uh, and this can affect uh, religious and cultural groups and so on but of course uh, in this kind of a conflict uh, obviously let us say how can we have peace certainly peace cannot come from economics which of course is already only about the profit and it cannot come from uh, let us say politics uh, which is uh, looking for power and only religions and uh, religion like ideologies can eventually uh, give us a sense of uh, values you know uh, like justice freedom equality uh, brotherhood and so on and from that let us say there is a desire for peace etc but the problem of course is that uh, religions also can be the causes of violence you know on the one hand what happens of course is that the religions uh, tend to um, legitimate the cultural and the social structures in which they live and function uh, like for instance in india hinduism justifies the caste system in europe uh, over centuries the christianity was justifying the system of slavery Uh, in islam uh, there is always complaints about the way they treat their women uh, religions tend to adjust themselves to the cultural and the socio political situation and therefore they lose some of their you know the inspirational power in that sense secondly of course religions also tend to be fundamentalists uh, not everybody but at least there are some groups in each religion Uh, that think that uh, their religion is the only true one and therefore they tend to look down on others as more or less true or even false a third reason of course is this what we call in india at least communalism that is the use of religion to bring people together as a political force and that is what we call communalism and so these causes eventually make religions also sometimes a source of violence and we see this in the kind of uh, phrases they use the word they use we speak of the crusades the jihads the just war or a conflict for dharma and so on but on the other hand uh, only religions as i already said uh, um, uh, is the source of uh, values you no know, like uh, freedom justice uh, equality and peace because even in a non religious societies like communism and so on 
you have other ideologies that are religion like you know like socialism for instance or communism itself or humanism they also give rise to values uh, uh, in, in a sense and uh, therefore i think eventually it is from these uh, sources uh, that eventually uh, we can bring about peace and if you go back to the history of religions uh, of course we have the the, the the founders like jesus the buddha uh, or uh, confucius or muhammad or we have saints like saint francis of assisi look at modern times we have uh, people like vivekananda in india mahatma gandhi Narayana Guru, Ambedkar, all these people have challenged the precisely unjust systems, uh, political, religious, economic, uh, from the point of view of their basic religious beliefs and convictions. Ambedkar even chose to change his religion uh, from being a Hindu who became a Buddhist. Another important uh, source of peace uh, where religions are concerned is precisely uh, conflict resolution. And this conflict resolution, of course, uh, should be based on values like truth uh, of knowing what exactly happened. Then, of course, focus on justice so that the people who are affected, eventually justice is done to them. Uh, let us say the, what they have lost, uh, for instance, is replaced, whatever. Uh, in that way, they are helped and so on. But basically, I think the one uh, value necessary cause is uh, forgiveness. Because uh, normally what happens is that in a situation of violence, uh, it is, uh, we, we always speak in the, in, in the uh, say in a phrase like the, uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for life, etc. Kind of a tit for tat. And of course, uh, if eventually you repay violence with violence, uh, or what you have of course is simply a, a spiral of violence. And this is what happens. Therefore, violence continues and gets uh, worse and worse. Therefore, if you want to break this cycle of violence, the only possibility is that at some stage you decide that, okay, let us start anew and uh, let us forgive each other. Uh, we may have hurt each other or it may have been one-sided. And yet, you know, we, the, the person who is hurt uh, is ready to forgive. And the person who has done the hurt is ready to ask forgiveness. And this leads to kind of a reconciliation and life starts anew. As a matter of fact, in South Africa, Bishop Desmond Tutu called this uh, restorative justice as opposed to retributive justice. But retributive justice precisely speaks about this idea of an eye for an eye based on revenge. You know, you want to take revenge, you are angry, etc. Whereas restorative justice speaks precisely in terms of rebuilding community through forgiveness, forgiving each other and so on. And this forgiveness is only possible uh, for religious reasons so eventually you consider the other as your brother or eventually you, you look on God himself as someone who forgives us and therefore who inspires us to forgive others uh, and the, the, especially you see this for instance in the teachings of Jesus where love and forgiveness seem to go together and uh, therefore uh, of course uh, in India itself uh, Mahatma Gandhi of course in here in this was really a follower of uh, Jesus Christ where he insisted very much on uh, the value of truth. He spoke of uh, satyagraha, clinging to truth, and he spoke of forgiveness uh, in order to build up community, uh, even when you are fighting for your rights, for your freedom, and so on and so forth. You don't look on the other as your enemy, but eventually as a friend who will perhaps, uh, who is misled now, uh, but in the context of your struggle, will come to look on the truth. Of course, if you look around the world, some countries like Pakistan, for instance, uh, seek to build a unity around, say, one religion, the religion of the majority, say, Islam. So Pakistan is an Islamic society. And think of China, who think that uh, one good solution is to kind of, uh, if not abolish all religion, at least to privatize it. So that religion has no place in public life at all and public life remains uh, what they call secular or without uh, any religious affiliation. A third possible solution which many countries take, uh, which of, of course uh, India also has taken, the other examples would be like the United States of America or Indonesia for instance, where uh, religions are acknowledged you know, as positive forces in society 
uh, and yet uh, the, the, they are uh, all treated equally therefore no one religion is preferred over the other and uh, therefore there is a possibility precisely of religions coming together and collaborating for the good of all and uh, we often call this a secular society a secular society therefore india for instance calls itself a secular democratic republic uh, where people um, uh, live together though belong to different religions and affirm each other also affirm each other's religion appreciate them and uh, in a context of dialogue uh, work together i think this obviously should be the context of uh, living in a multi-religious society in this kind of a context uh, what can we actually do to to promote uh, fellowship and community uh, i think there are two uh, two basic things you can say how to live in a multi-religious society and how to act in a multi-religious society a Canadian philosopher called Charles Taylor enunciates three principles that in a situation of difference you have to uh, recognize the other you know, as the other person is an all truth then you have to secondly respect the other and thirdly you have to accept the other then another way in trying to promote this kind of fellowship is to say to visit each other's sacred places or uh, to celebrate together at a social level, you know, some important festivals like Diwali, Ramzan, uh, Christmas. Uh, for instance, for a Christmas, I have seen uh, mothers uh, make cakes and distribute to all their neighbors, also of other religions. Uh, around Ramzan, for instance, we have these iftar parties in which even politicians take place, you know, irrespective of their religious affiliation and so on. The same way Diwali becomes, you know, all children of whatever religion, they all like to fire their crackers and so on. So in that sense, I think we, we have to learn to live together and recognizing each other, appreciating each other. That is uh, what I call living together in a multi-religious way. Uh, a second is, of course, acting multiculturally, multi-religiously. So John Rawls, who was a political philosopher, who was... Uh, say very active in the United States for instance, he spoke precisely of how we have to develop overlapping consensus between different groups that live together in a society. And this overlapping consensus can be developed only through dialogue, to talking to each other, sharing each other's perspectives, sharing each other's goals, uh, values, and so on. Now, the Indian constitution, for instance, which lays out, for instance, the preamble, you know, the basic, uh, the basic goals uh, like freedom, justice, fellowship, uh, and uh, secularism, and also the directive principles, like how we have to uh, reach out to the poor and uh, look at uh, religious pluralism, and so on. Therefore, there we have in the constitutions a kind of a basic framework uh, around which uh, we can eventually focus uh, our collaboration. And over the last uh, more than 60 years or so, the, where there had been some attempts to tamper with this consensus, the courts have stood by these values. It is for us, therefore, to interiorize uh, and uh, make them operative in the way we live uh, together. Uh, in the country. Uh, when we are dialoguing with the different cultures and religions, uh, there is always the possibility not only of uh, mutual learning, but also mutual enrichment. And this can even lead to a mutual challenge. When we really know the other very well, then we can challenge them on what we think may be perhaps uh, um, little injustices in their tradition just come to, come to them because of the cultural and the social setting and so on. Therefore, there is a possibility of mutual challenge and mutual growth together also through dialogue. And the third point of dialogue precisely is uh, how uh, eventually, let us say, uh, we can promote uh, common ventures to promote freedom, fellowship, justice, uh, equality and so on. So I really think that dialogue is, uh, is a way, dialogue between cultures, dialogue between ethnic groups, but also dialogue between religions is the way, is the only way for a future of peace in our country.
uh, India and also I think uh, across the world etc. And in this process I think we have to energize and empower, awaken if you like the majority which might tend to be occasionally silent uh, and uh, marginalize therefore the smaller groups of people who might tend to be fundamentalist, uh, communalists and so on and so forth. I think we can say that the Indian people through uh, uh, a whole series of elections in recent times have shown their commitment to a secular society uh, and not easily misled by fundamentalist or communalist uh, outfits uh, who try to promote a particular religion. I will conclude with this uh, that ultimately one concrete way in which this dialogue uh, can be promoted is coming together to pray, to pray for peace. Yes. And that precisely shows how eventually uh, we in India, uh, we uh, people of different religions and so on, we can work for peace. And the symbol that you, you are seeing by my side is precisely uh, uh, an indication of this integration that we want to bring. If you find if you, the, the basic framework is the OM, written in Tamil and within that uh, you find the cross on top and the chakra which is the symbol of Buddhism below and the whole thing is topped by the crescent and the star which is a symbol of Islam. So here we have in one symbol the integration between Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism and Islam and I think that can be a model for us precisely to work together, to dialogue together and to so that we can really live in peace and harmony for the goodness and the happiness of everyone. Thank you.